Welcome back to the FS Podcast or Freelance Society Podcast. I think we're going to go with the FS Podcast. I'm Dylan Roberts. I'm Christian Steven. All right, we're going to try this a little bit differently. Um, Christian's in LA. I'm in uh, pretty much in Austin, Texas. And um, we got some good feedback from the first two episodes that we did. And we're going to commit on trying to do more. Um, I think it's just good just to continue to see where this leads and, but what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, committing to trying is, is good enough. I think, you know, as a form of therapy, just for us, it's useful by itself. And if people find, find it interesting, then that works as well. Right. Well, kind of today's topic I want to talk about just because I feel like always, uh, during this time of like the weather, March, April, in, in May, for some reason, maybe it's just because the weather is changing, a lot of natural disasters occur. And you and me have covered quite a few um, natural disasters, whether it's working for news companies or working for nonprofits. A lot of the times it's both um, doing our own photos, but you know, for some reason that I was just looking back, a lot of the natural disasters, coincidence or not, kind of happens around this time. Nashville just had a really bad uh, tornado um, that d- hit one of the main part of the cities. So, but the two kind of ones that I want to talk about is kind of Nepal uh, earthquake in 2015, which that. Uh, it's been estimated that uh, nearly 9,000 people were killed and over 22,000 were injured. And it was such a hard place to cover because so much of the destruction was outside of the main city. So yeah, I kind of want to talk about natural disasters, reporting it, just our background, and kind of kick off of Nepal. Do you m- kind of remember you know, when that happened, where we were? Yeah, I remember because we had just finished a, uh, I think it was a three-fold trip of, uh, I think we did Iraq, and then we did, uh, no, I just done Afghanistan, Central Africa Republic, we met in Iraq, and then we were coming through London to sort of take a break and um, do an equipment run. And then I think it was literally the day after we arrived in London, the earthquake hit Nepal. And so mm-hmm. we were literally on the ground for about 12 hours in the UK. And we were on a plane uh, going over to Nepal. And I had never, I had never been before. So yeah, it, was, same. it was the first time I'd, I was visiting a country that my only frame of reference was, um, was in the uh, uh, vision of, of disaster. It was interesting, too, because I'd never, I'd never arrived in an airport that was so obviously, yeah. you know, ill-equipped to receive basically aid um, teams from all over the world. I mean, you basically had the Norwegians, the Swedes, the Peace Corps, the, UN, the Peace Corps, you know, literally everyone and everyone was waiting for all of their stuff to get off the um, time. Like I also had a weird moment where, you know, um, one of the things that built up my cynicism, which I've also now dealt with doing away with, but one of the things that did was when we arrived, I saw a team of volunteers who were taking a selfie Mm-hmm. In front of some of the destruction and they had they were smiling in the first selfie and then they talked amongst each other and they were like we should really do a serious one because it's serious and then they did, right. did that so i yeah no yeah go keep going keep no i was just saying there was an element of uh it was really really bizarre seeing how the aid apparatus sort of springs to life and how it um comes together so quickly but also what happens to a country when world aid organizations hit it um and and sort of how the um uh how aid people are a different breed of people than sort of you know journalists or civilians you know what i mean yeah i think they have to at least from some of the organizations that either have worked with or seen especially in nepal they all had to go to this one area in Kathmandu, the main city where it's known as like the old city. And that's where a lot of destruction was mainly because these buildings were so old and 
everyone was taking photos there. And then if you kind of do brief research, you'll see like people posting a photo saying we're here doing aid and everything, but there's probably, you know, 50 other organizations doing the same thing. And what we later realize is most of the destruction, at least um, a lot of the casualties were way outside the city in Nepal where it was somewhat difficult just to get out there. Even if there wasn't, you know, a natural disaster where the roads were just crumbling, you know, it's hard to get through unless you were hiking or using a helicopter. So I immediately noticed just aid organizations just trying to go find, uh, you know, rubble or destroyed building and taking photos of it and then trying to raise money and saying, hey, we need money to help these people. And I'm in the back of like, well, a lot of this is happening outside the main city. Yeah. So I do, I do want to say, I do want to say a lot of aid organizations do really, really good work. Yeah. yeah. There are, but there are a lot of organizations that are, do we swear on this podcast? Uh, we can. Excited. No, I just think a lot of aid organ- organizations are completely full of shit. In mm-hmm. the way of there's, there's uh, a good amount that do incredible work, are on the ground, they've dedicated their lives to it, they're incredible people. But there's quite a few outliers who literally just go from photo opportunity to photo opportunity, taking pictures and saying, we're working here. And then as soon as they take the picture, they fuck off and let the locals just dig through the rubble for their possessions. Whereas the really, really good aid, aid organizations, like the ones we linked up with, uh, eventually, after we sort of sorted through all of the, um, the, the people who were just there for pictures, were finding ways to get out into the far reaches. Um, that's when we linked up with the British Special Forces, who were busy doing mountain warfare training uh, mm. on the side of Everest. And then we basically connected with them because they came down from Everest and then uh, got on a convoy of jeeps and motorcycles and helicopters to go out into the far-flung countryside. And that's sort of where we split off, I think, because you went to yeah. one area to another. I I went with an old friend uh, of ours who has a small nonprofit, and, uh, and he knew Nepal pretty well, and he spent covering natural disasters for a long time. And I went out with him to about one mile uh, near the Tibetan border, which uh, is believed that's where the epicenter of the earthquake happened. And this one area, I mean, I think that's where a lot of the uh, casualties were happening. Um, I mean, almost every single building was destroyed. These are remote villages and... Uh, when we went out there, we were like the first international people able to make it. And the the local people that were driving us from Kathmandu to um, this one area, I want to, I think I'm going to say this correctly, but I'm not sure it's, it's pronounced Signapachu District. And we later filmed there for the VR film that we did during the one year anniversary. Uh, is that the Sind of the Chuck? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, or, Probably butchering it. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And this one area was just completely destroyed. And, um, but even that, the family that was driving us, uh, that's where he's originally from, but lives in the main city. And that was his first time. He had no idea if his sister was alive, his mom was alive, all his extended family. And, uh, yeah, when we pulled up, got a car and that's because all communication was completely destroyed. And, um, but yeah, but they were like, you know, they're a small NGO nonprofit, but they did the research. They've traveled there, they're experienced. And later in the weeks, you would start seeing more organizations going to those areas. Um, so it is a difficult, I find out you have to do a lot of research and have really good local partners, uh, in that country. Cause if you're trying it all by yourself, which Nepal is such a friendly country, maybe you can, and it's a tourist country and a lot of people speak English, but still, you know, if you don't have the right local people, you're not going to be able to operate either as a journalist or aid organization. Yeah, or as just a human being, I, I think uh, that's that. I agree with you. That's one of the things that really divides the good from the bad. 
eight organizations, which is, you know, which one, which ones uh, among them basically um, take it upon themselves to find and invest in really good uh, local contacts. Mm -hmm. Because when something, when something does happen, you need to have the humility to say, I don't know as much about your country, obviously, as you do. Tell me where we need to be. Whereas, you know, a good amount of the aid organizations were just coming in and going, well, I guess we'll focus on the main city. Whereas, you know, a lot of the um, smaller and, and also the larger, more intelligent aid organizations were like, okay, well, we need to go off the intelligence that we have and we need, need to go into the rural areas where people don't have the infrastructure and where mm -hmm. most of the construction is quite thinly put together. So it's, you know, I think it was, what, 80% of the buildings? Oh, still, yeah. Still it was, I mean, if any, if the building didn't have proper rebar or anything, it was pretty much destroyed. So that's why so much of the encampment do the main city, the old part of the city, like that was pretty much rebel. Um, but, you know, most of the country houses, you know, where it's very hard to get to, you know, they don't have rebar, you know, very few houses had rebar. Um, and that's where you would, I mean, I met one family, I still have a video clip of like a father that was just, taking he was moving brick by hand and he's like yep my daughter is somewhere under here and it's just like you know it's and then you just get you hear reports of what the casualties are and that kind of leads in you remember going to the uh the the cremation of how they were just burning bodies right yeah i still have those pictures somewhere that was that was something else that was interesting that was a that was a weird one for us, I think, because mm -hmm. uh, we'd been in plenty of places where, you know, there's a, a shitload of dead bodies around and, you know, you just sort of put them in, in the fire pit or the burn pit or they're buried or something like that. But it was the first time that I'd seen people ceremonially uh, burned um, in a way that was in keeping with the tradition. But because there was so many bodies, they had to expedite it. So we're basically along... The riverside in this temple watching you know uh, the bodies being burned at a rate that uh, um, they had never put through before that was interesting I, I still remember the smell because you're particularly sensitive to smell oh yeah uh, I think I had a dream last night where I could remember a smell I'm like ugh. but yeah I the footage and some of the photos and they were burning you know 200 to the 300 bodies a, a day well, just that one spot more, I think, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. But that one main spot that's in the main part of the city where it's like a holy-type river or pond. Um, but super, It's super interesting. Just like I didn't know what we were going to talk about in regards to, like, I thought this would be sort of a podcast about sort of what do we think about natural disasters, but what is, what is being revealed to me just as we're talking about is, like, I have a lot of unfinished business with Nepal. Yeah. yeah I mean, like I, it's it's interesting i was thinking about this the other day in the way of i know every every person who travels and does sort of what we do and, and aid workers as well and journalists it's you've always got that one country that just sort of does something to you early on that you haven't quite reconciled with mm -hmm. and i'm coming you know the older i get and the more settled i get um and the longer i'm sort of uh sober and more of a you know together adult and less of a crazy person um, the more I'm sort of realizing, like, at some point soon, I need to go back to Nepal and do a postmortem on what that country sort of did to us. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's I mean, as far as a country is beautiful, um, I'm not crazy about the main city, uh, just because it's scooter. If you think we have a scooter problem. Oh, my God. <laughs> let me just tell you, they, they had a scooter problem a long time oh ago. God, so insanely, but you'll never see anyone hit anyone. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, but the people are very friendly. You know, it has its problems like, you know, other countries. And uh, But ju just as far as just welcoming extremely nice people, um, yeah, I, I, Nepal is my top three countries that even though... They're very proud people of them. Yeah, even though most of our stories when we're there has to be sad or some of lifting you know um it's one of my favorite countries to go to i think 
I would love to go there just for, just for vacation, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and especially that one area that I was talking um, earlier about near the uh, Tibetan border is such a peaceful place. You saw, is that where you saw that bloated body floating in the river though? Oh, oh yeah, there were in the river and stuff don't like pick that. that place for a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, this is where I saw that that, <laughs> that body floating in the water. Yeah. And this thing, you know, and that's that's sort of that's one of the sort of memories that that uh, I'm sure lingers um, for you in your mind. Because I remember we were diff- we were in different parts of the country when when you pretty sort much of, yeah. you sent me a text and you were like, it's it's fucking it's real. real. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, we were like the first, I mean, the aid organ, Thurston Moore is what it's called. And uh, the founder, Craig Miller, is not with us anymore, just for certain reasons, I won't say. And uh, had nothing to do with that country. Not in a way of no longer in friendship with us, but he's not alive anymore. Yeah, correct. Okay, you said it better. And, uh, and, um, but yeah, he was the first aid organization there. I was, you know one of the first with a camera. Um, I, I, I'm just going by just what local people were telling me that, but yeah, it was just chaotic. Just people moving rubble with their hands, you know, bodies flowing in the river. Um, and it is a difficult drive to get out there. I mean, you had to wait for road clearings and moving, you know, rocks and waiting for, you know, uh, big machinery to move these gigantic boulders. Um, so yeah, it was, it was an interesting time. I was a, it was a weird headspace too, because again, we were just coming off, um, like I had done the Afghanistan central Africa Republic and then we'd met and done an intense trip in Iraq and we were Mm -hmm. ready to sort of take like a month or two off. And then we went Mm -hmm. straight to this. We were not, we did not have the gear for that country. (laughs) Oh my God. No, not at all. And I remember uh, checking in my bag, which is, and I didn't have to check in my bag. And it was such a dumb thing to do. That's right. And I, oh, that's right. so well, like, lucky. Yeah. Uh, because good thing to know, good tip. If you are covering a natural disaster, especially a big one, and you're flying in, try not to check in a bag, especially if you're a photojournalist or a videographer. Because so many people are coming into that country, and um, and I couldn't believe that I actually was able to find my bag because we just saw stacks of bags just in the terminal, just everywhere, and I'm just looking at Christian, just being like, "Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna have clothes." I was I was smart enough that I had all my camera gear on me, but I was like, "I'm about to go." two plus weeks with just a you know one pair of clothing which turns out i mean we got so dirty and disgusting anyway it didn't matter. oh yeah oh i remember unpacking and like opening my luggage and my wife was like what is that smell i was like (laughs) i was like yeah it's probably everything you can think of so it's every smell ever made Mm. yeah do you remember you kind of started just kind of on the journalism side of covering a natural disaster? You that's kind of where you started being on camera quite a you know a little bit here the and ball, there. Yeah, yeah, it was an interesting one because we we basically got to the point because we were just shooting together, mm-hmm. and uh, it got to we got to a place where we had to record some sort of reports and stand ups, mm-hmm. um, and. Um, and basically, like, we didn't have anyone to do it. We didn't have a, a report, uh, like, sort of a host with us. And so I de facto became the person who was standing and sort of saying, we're here and this is happening and this is what's around us and X, Y, and Z. And actually, that's where I sort of got to uh, uh, do it for the first time properly. I think I, I think we had done it once in Iraq, but that was just, you know. That oh, was, yeah. No, that was good, but still. <laughs> You know, but still, but yeah, it was it was interesting because I mean, as somebody who's on camera, you're you're trying to describe what you're seeing in real time, and it was the first time I'd noticed the compartmentalization of sort of like I have to take aside my feelings of what I'm feeling about what is going on, and I have to just get into a place where I'm just saying what is around. 
mm-hmm. and context. And trying to gather information in the area they are. And so it does, I know we can make fun of the news quite a bit, you know, and they do mess it, but it's really hard to, okay, you're in this situation. You're literally in this one area for even like an hour, still gathering information. All right, get, get on camera. And a lot of times you don't even have an hour. You just like, that's the look that's, that's uh, compared with the negative side of it, which is when we've seen, when we've seen people who are in the hotel bar, and then oh, they're yeah. just like, oh shit, hold on. And then they go up with that cameraman to the roof, put on a bulletproof vest, and they're like, we're here and walk to on Baghdad. And yeah. then, they take, then they finish their bit, take off the vest, and go down and have another drink. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, it's like, that's... I'm on the Mosul front line reporting from Istanbul, Turkey. I'm like, like, what? <laughs> 100%. Yeah. Which is why I always think, I think if you're doing a, look, the news, news organizations want stand ups. But I think it's almost always better if you can do it within the place and not just as a talking head in, in a room in a hotel somewhere. Yeah, I think there's just when a na- big natural disaster happens, there's just so much information overload. And I mean, you're seeing it kind of I mean, Corona is not like a category as a natural disaster is, I guess, you know, epidemic. Um, but just so much information comes at you, especially like the Houston hurricane Harvey, um, which I was reporting, did a lot of stuff for New York times and just the amount of information and the demand you had to find a story and go to certain areas. Luckily, I'm, I went to high school in Houston, so I knew a lot of the areas and it was easy for me to, to find different stories, but it was just a crazy time of like, how much information, you know, not just posting one day and doing one story is good enough. You have to keep going. Let's think as well, it's sort of when you're getting information in constantly changing environments, you need to sort of triple check and quadruple check before you even mm-hmm. send one thing back to, you know, uh, HQ or wherever you're sending your stories to. So, I mean, I think that's one mistake that really uh, young and new journalists make which is as soon as they get something they get so excited and they're like i have to tell head office about this and it's like no you need to you need to check that through multiple sources and if they all say the same thing then you can start to think about maybe putting it together into a story yeah it's um it's really fast paced you you think you have a story and then you actually you end up going to that one location you end and then it's just like it's not what you think it is and that's where you can get in trouble, where you either fabricate the situation because you're there and you're spending time and maybe someone else's money and it doesn't work out. But I think it's always better to be honest. And um, there is like a, th- a thread line where you want to go do that story, but is it the one that you thought it was? And it turned out, you know. Sometimes it turns out to be something else entirely, which is better. But I have a lot of respect for when I see journalists who are on the ground and even when they're, you know, doing a piece uh, to camera where they go, we don't know yet, but here's what we know so far. Instead of uh, the people who are saying, it's this, it's this, it's this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you had to, uh, when covering a natural disaster, would you, do you like working with news companies or nonprofits? Because they're too different, but I was just curious what you... That's a really good question. Uh, both. Because what I would say is what I would like to do is I would like to cover something for the nonprofit and ride with them. Mm-hmm. Through that, get the access through which to deliver a yeah. good story to the news organization. So it's a trick question. But Yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand, especially in natural disasters, because for a lot of the access part, you know, you're going to be riding, probably getting your access through nonprofits. You know, especially when I covered uh, um, the Haiti that hit, uh, sorry, the hurricane that hit Haiti, um, Hurricane Matthew, it was. I was doing both. I was working with Action Aid UK. And then after I made sure everything was completed with the nonprofit and what we had to do, but was able to get a lot of different access and stories and local partners. Then I worked with a news organization, which was Seeker, um, and did a VR film. So I think it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, I think a nonprofit, you have to treat them like a client base and whatever they say, what they want, 
you get it with the news. It's, um, if you find a story and you pitch it and they like it, then you could just go do it. So it's, it's different in the same kind of. Yeah. I mean, there's that. And then that's if you have the ability to set those things up within, you know, cause it happens and then you're on the plane to go to it. And then if you can set those things up, great. But sometimes you just go out there and then you're making it up as you go in the way of, okay, well I'm here, I'm covering this story. And then in the evenings, you're basically trying to call and say, Hey, well, I can get you this story, this story, this story. And then you're also trying to get contacts together for the people on the ground to say, Hey, can I ride with you to this place, this place, this place? So, I mean, every single one is different, you know, especially with natural disasters, because it's it, the more, more so than war zones. It's an ever changing, um, uh, landscape in the way of every single day, something different is happening and there's no constant. Whereas in a war zone, you've got, you know, generally you've got battle lines and different sides and different protocols because that's the nature of a military apparatus. Uh, even mm -hmm. if it's malicious, they still have organization. Whereas during a natural disaster, it is a natural disaster. And so, you know, it's not something that was prepared for at all. Although, you know, uh, a lot of the aid organizations are prepared for many of the things. Uh, it's never what, uh, it's never completely what people prepare for. Right. Is there, um, I think, have you seen any changed, any natural, like the Australian fires? Um, when I, when I first hear the, the words natural disaster, like I, I bristle a bit because mm -hmm. a lot of that is due to climate change. But even if you look at coronavirus right now, it's because, you know, we were, keeping animals in cages on top of each other and, and letting the different sort of bodily fluids intermix. And because, mm -hmm. you know, over there humans were eating things that they shouldn't have been eating. And that's just what it is. And so what you'll find is that natural disasters are less natural. And generally, it's the product of humans uh, fucking with Mother Nature. And so we can say it's a natural disaster, but really, it's a man made disaster that comes through the form of a natural um, retaliation, if that makes sense. No, I get it. Yeah. I, um, I mean, Houston is a kind of a perfect example because it's pretty much kind of an area where even with just rain, you're, it's going to flood. Like there's some areas where they build houses. I'm like, why do they keep building houses in this area? It's, it's just going to get money. Yeah. So it's a, it's going to be interesting you know, year, you know, 2020, you know, usually there's one big, you know, or a few, you know, natural disasters that happen. And I'm curious to see if there's going to continue to be just information overload where you see two opposite sides. Now there's not, there's not just one side. It's just, everything has to be divided into two. Totally. Or, or 10, but you've also got the case of between between um, uh, how the news cycle is obsessed with the domestic policies in the Trump administration, mm -hmm. and also, you know, it's basically between you split between coronavirus and Trump, and that's all people are covering. You know what I mean? And so it was, for example, when Nepal hit, we were at a time where foreign news stories were getting coverage, and mm -hmm. the news organizations were actually covering things that were happening worldwide. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Whereas now it seems to have contracted into much more of domestic news networks. Yeah, I, f I felt like when I were in Nepal, I felt like our stories were Maybe. making it, yeah, yeah reaching, reaching, and, and there, there was, was an understanding of it. Totally, but even like in the in some of the more recent uh, trips that we did to like Iraq, it seems very much the case of not just because it's an endless war like in Afghanistan, but it also seems like global stories now. Um, aren't getting the attention that they used to get. And that's, you know, that's because there's a very uh, unpredictable and uh, different administration in the White House at the moment that does things very differently than the previous one. But also with the first term of any uh, president, you know, the news tends to skew towards the domestic policy, which I think is totally appropriate because when a country has more issues internally than uh, it has the appetite to focus on disasters globally, then you're going to have news focused that way. So if, for example, I think if the Nepal earthquake happened now, mm -hmm. you would be on the ticker line on the news. Yeah, I, 
I 100% believe that. Because even the Australian fires, even though that was, it got mainstream, I feel like it was just like a blip, you know? I'm pretty sure PewDiePie had more views in one video than that thing ever. It's funny. I mean, well, you have an entire nation that's on fire for two thirds of the year and it just becomes a story. You know what I mean? That's what it takes to, to be, um, uh, to draw people's eyeballs outside of the domestic issues. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to figure out why that is. I think it's humans are wired differently when we watch content now. I think we're, we don't know. Honestly, we've never been in a time of where you can just look at unlimited amount of information. And so how do you even pick? I think that is really going to affect how content is made. And I'm curious what that looks like in the future. You know, when we go cover, when we go out onto our next projects, you know, wherever that is, that's always something in the, what I think about is, is it, it's obviously not the same anymore, but I'm wondering, you know, with this information overload, how that impacts covering natural disasters. I think the answer in many ways to what happens when there is uh, a feedback loop of so much information and there's information fatigue, I think the way to combat that is by curation. Mm -hmm. And so basically if you can sort of go to a place and tell one good story that reflects the larger changing environment of that place, whether it's focusing on a character or, or one issue, I think that's a way to sort of cancel out the noise. But also you'll find with the rise of longer form um content it, you know we we had a, a few years where people were like people only want to see things that are 60 seconds to two minutes and it turns out yeah. watching two and a half hour podcasts yeah you know? and so it's really uh, it's really not so much about changing the content for everyone it's about creating content for a specific audience mm -hmm. yeah i agree and that's comforting to know I mean, just look what Joe Rogan's doing. I mean, I think I think that is the somewhat I'm excited for when it comes to content is you're going to see people putting more trust in, into individual content creators. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that's just me thinking out loud, but I, I love what I see what Joe Rogan does, even though I'm not crazy about every podcast that he does. But... Um, I do like it. I think it's, I learned something more. Yeah. I think there's an element to that, which is also, uh, people are more inclined nowadays to trust someone who says, look, I don't know, but I'm going to talk to someone who says that they do. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much, so much that appeals to me about that in the way of also how we work on the ground, which is, I'm not going to tell you I'm an expert on this place that we flew into. What I am an expert at is gathering media and finding the right people to talk to. Yeah. And I think saying you're an expert in doing that is much better than saying you're an expert in every single subject. And yeah. I think that's what I've, I'm gravitating to in, in relation to that kind of expertise because I mean, I've got the one thing I've gotten more comfortable with as the years have passed is saying, I don't know, but I have a, I have a desire to find out. And I think that's what counts more than, um, you know, spending years studying a specific very, very niche mm -hmm. so that you can say you know everything about it. Because lots of people are doing that. So you just got to talk to them. Right. And just because you went to one country doesn't make you an expert. Like I went to Haiti once, cover a natural disaster. I'm not expert in Haiti. Like I know how to get a story and coverage. And, you know, there's a lot of things that are very similar when covering international affairs. But each country is so different. They have their own politics. Eat, the people are different. So just because you go to one country, cover it for two weeks and come back. You're just now starting, in my opinion. One of the best, one of the best skills for being a journalist is being humble. You know, mm -hmm. and that, took me, that took me a while to find, figure out, but it's very much a case of saying, look, I'm not going to profess to know everything about it, but what I can do is ask the right people and ask the right questions. And that's good journalism. Yeah. Yeah. I'm an expert in Will Ferrell movies. That's a pretty much it. And that's a, that's a true story. That's, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's a good <laughs> ending point. Right it there. was a good ending point. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, any last thoughts on your side? No, I think we need to go back to Nepal soon. Yeah, let's do it. I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for to see what that country has been doing. It's kind of been off the radar, um, 
and yeah, I think this is uh, this is our third episode of the FS podcast. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll be back again, and uh, we look forward to the next one. Thank you.